Today we're actually finishing the series we've been in for um, a long time. And it's uh, kind of a series about what would it look like if God's kingdom were to come, if God's will were to be done right here, right now in our lives, in our midst, in our church, in our community, in our nation. What would it look like? And so we're, we're talking about that. And we've been mentioning that God's kingdom come, his will be done, would be people choosing to follow Jesus with all their heart, mind, and soul. And we said, you know, and part of following Jesus is about three relationships, which we've talked about, two of them. What does it mean to build a relationship with God? What does it mean to know God? And um, you allowed me to do something very different last week uh, as we talked about prayer. Some of you came up and said that was so helpful. Some came up and were like, not really, and, um, and that's okay. I told you at the beginning it was an experiment, and I, you know, and mostly it gave out a lot of different resources about how to just learn how to get to know God, and, um, and then the week before that we talked about getting to know each other and building this community, this church family, a, a spiritual family of people to help you follow Jesus, but today there's a third relationship, God, each other, and then a relationship with the world. Probably one of my absolute favorite messages is what I get to share with you today because I think that it is neglected too often, but I think that if we would put into practice the picture that Jesus shows us today, and I'm not him, I'm just going to be talking about him, um, that picture you are going to see, I think it would change the world. I think it would change our city, change our communities, our country. I mean, people's lives would be changed if we would try to become more like Jesus in this way. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And um, I wanted to start with a, uh, a story that is a true story, and uh, it's one I heard a pastor share. He was talking about, he was sitting in a restaurant with a friend. The friend was not a follower of Jesus. He was actually just um, a co-worker in a different area of life, and uh, they had been, they'd known each other. They were just, you know, they liked to get together every once in a while. And this particular time, the conversation shifted towards Christianity. And um, after listening to this friend share about why he did not believe in God, the pastor shared his well-rehearsed outline of why Christianity is true. And um, the friend asked some questions, the pastor answered them. And what was remarkable is that the friend seemed to agree with almost everything that the pastor was saying. And so the pastor asked the friend, is there anything that that keeps you from accepting this gift Christ offers. You seem to agree with almost everything. And the friend responded, I can totally see why this makes sense to you, but it's just not for me. And the pastor was like, but if it's true and it makes sense, why not believe? And the friend was like, really, it's just not for me. And, you know, the pastor being pastorly kept pushing and pushing. If it makes sense, why wouldn't you want to believe? And it's the, re- the friend's response that just pierces my soul. Because the friend said this. He says, you know, I guess I just, I really don't want to be like you. I don't want to be like you. So let me ask. If you are in this room today and you consider yourself a follower of Jesus... I want to ask you, do people want to be like you? Now, if you're in here and you do not consider yourself a follower of Jesus, you are off the hook. <laughs> I'm not a, you are welcome to not be liked, but, <laughs> and I mean, seriously, you're off the hook because right now I'm talking to those of you who say, I follow Jesus. Do people want to be like you? See, if you're not convinced about all this Christianity stuff, I want you to know something. I am so glad you're here today for two reasons. You picked a great day to come. One, because I want to, first of all, I want to apologize to you. Because I know this. Very often, the picture of faith that you have witnessed because of those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, that picture is often not very attractive. We don't do a good job sometimes. And I am deeply sorry for that because the picture that Jesus portrayed was so different. People who did not follow Jesus always wanted to be around him. He seemed to be a magnet for the messed up people and the broken people and the hurt people and the rejected people. And 
they loved him. For some reason, many of us as followers of Jesus, we don't portray that picture, and I am sorry. But the second reason I am so glad you're here today is because you're going I'm hoping that in this next 30 minutes, I am able to paint for you a picture of what followers of Jesus are supposed to look like. Because it really is a beautiful picture. And maybe that's not the picture you've seen before. But I'm hoping that when we leave today, all of us have this picture of what it looks like to be like Jesus. Because as followers of Jesus, aren't we supposed to become more like him? So that's what we're going to be talking to, to, um, about today. And I really think that the reason that so many Christians don't look like Jesus or that picture of Jesus is because it's hard. It's hard. It, we have to be so selfless. And that goes against our very nature. All of us get that. I mean, if you have kids, you understand we are self-centered creatures from the very moment we are born. It's hard following Jesus because it's hard being selfless. He was so amazing, Jesus was, at loving the wrong people and angering the right people. I mean, we want to do the opposite. We try to stay away from messed up people, and we try to spend our time with people who believe like us and act like us and seem to have it all together, which is an illusion because none of us have it together. Raise your hand if you have it all together. Exactly. Look around. We don't. We're all messed up. But we seem to think we want to hang around people who aren't, and that makes us feel like we aren't. And when we hang around people who all agree, you know what happens? We become weird. We do. We become really weird if all we do is hang around people like us. Not only do we become weird, we also can become mean. I had a friend in high school. If you called his house, you know, we were teenagers, and this was a long time ago, so it was, you know, when people had landlines and stuff, and you'd call his house, and you would hear his voicemail message, and it would be the dad explaining the entire message of how to follow Jesus on the voicemail. Like, it went on for minutes. And at the end of that, he would give you an opportunity to pray and accept Jesus before you could leave a message. <laughs> it was crazy. I'm like, that's not helpful. That's weird. It's weird. <laughs> I know many restaurant servers who say that Sunday church, the Sunday church crowd are the worst tippers. What? How is that even possible? Sunday should be the day every server wants to work because the tipping is so good. I even heard of a pastor who said that instead of leaving money, he would leave a pamphlet explaining Christianity. No, no. He said that the pamphlet's what the server really needed. And I'm like, I have no words, no words of what to say to that person. All right, I'm going to ask your forgiveness now if you're offended, okay? If I do that, please don't email me, and if you do, that's okay, I'll, I'll laugh. Okay, <laughs> I want you to look at these church signs that I'm going to share with you. These are real, these are not the cheesy ones that sometimes there's fake ones all over. These are all real, and I want you to ask yourself as you read these, who, who are these signs for, okay? Who are they trying to communicate with? Look at this one. Independent, old-timey, hellfire, brimstone, king, James, preaching. Who is that for? Because, yeah, I'm like, if, if, you, if you like this, you probably already go to this church, okay? <laughs> and if you are looking to find God, I'm like, I don't think I'm going there. Um, hmm. All right, look at the next one. Do you know what hell is? Come hear our preacher. <laughs> I looked. This isn't the church for the previous sign, although I thought maybe it would be, but it's a different church. But yes, yeah, so if you want to experience hell, we got the place to go. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. Oh, sweet. I didn't even know that. That's awesome. I'm not going to say that one out loud. All right, look at this one. This is horrible. Tsunami, AIDS, war. Do you hear me now? God. Welcome. 
I mean, there's so much wrong with this. Like, God is the one who's creating the tsunami, the AIDS, and the war. I mean, it's like, this is what he, Jesus came so that we could have tsunami, AIDS, and war. Welcome? I don't, again, you just go, who are they talking? And now these, I know, these are my people. I know, I'm a pastor. I just, I'm sorry. I just want, I'm sorry. Look at the next one. Jesus is the rizzle for the sizzle. <laughs> like, teenagers, when, when you see this, do you go, now that's a hip church. Yeah, I, I know, right? <laughs> Jesus is the rizzle. I'm like, oh, really? Did you just say that on a sign? Oh, please take that sign down. All right, now the next one is the one that could offend you. But I really, I, think about this, putting it on a church sign. Don't dishonor your father by sleeping with your mother. Okay, that's, that's probably good advice. <laughs> Similar to don't pick your nose in public. It's, a, it's good advice. Why would you put that on a sign? Who are you trying to communicate to? I mean, are you in a community where this is happening a lot? If so, there's better ways to tell them not to do that. But, oh. But then I wanted to end on probably my favorite one. All right, this one actually goes funny again. Um, can't believe it says this, but... Um, best sausage supper in St. Louis? Come and eat pastor Thomas Ressler. <laughs> now... I don't know when they started putting pastor and sausage, but I hear it's amazing in St. Louis. So, yeah, I know, I know. And I just realized I didn't put a slide after this. Can you just like blank it out? Because I don't want everybody looking at this slide for the next five minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so what if I... It doesn't matter. If, if people do, just ignore it. I know it's going to be hard to pay attention to eating Pastor Thomas Ressler in the sausage. All right. So as a Christian, people associate me with these different behaviors, right? People who leave long messages, people who don't tip, people who put weird signs in public. And I'm like, oh, these are public signs, right? They're not in the lobby. They're public these kinds of behaviors make it so difficult for some of us, right, to, to get to know our neighbor. And I mean this sincerely. Ray Lynn and I, we used to live in a, a pretty large neighborhood that people walked a lot. And we would be often playing out with our kids in the backyard on the swing set or something. And this one couple who was fairly new to the community would be pulling their wagon, walking their, their child every day. You know, and he'd, he'd always have his beer and his cute little cozy and having a blast. They were a fa great family thing, and they would always talk to us. And we'd always, I mean, sometimes we'd talk for an hour, you know, and every day it was like, if we were outside at the same time, they would be passing, and we just really started getting to know them. It came to a point, if I'm not even mistaken, we'd like, I don't know if they ever came, but we'd invite them to like a kid's birthday party or something. Even though the kids weren't the same age, it didn't matter. Come, we're having friends over. We'd love for you to be a part. At one point, and this was year, a couple years ago, Ray Lynn was having like a, a girl's party at the house, scrapbooking or something, I don't remember. But they, you know, she invited that girl and several other friends, and they all came over, and you know, I took off, went and saw a movie or something. Well, during the, this little party they were working and stuff, somebody had mentioned about Ray Lynn's husband being a pastor. We had never mentioned that to them. We'd never asked. They'd never asked what I did, and we just didn't think, didn't talk about it. What happened, though, is that, and I mean this, we never saw them again. Never. They never walked near our house again. I, I knew that he had had a bad church experience in his past. Um, I don't remember if somebody else told me or he did. It, like I said, it was a couple years ago. But I never, I never saw them again uh, in, in that way. I mean, every once in a while, we'd run into them at the store or something, and it was like they were cordial, high, but it was never like it used to be once they found out I was a pastor. And it breaks my heart because whatever picture he had of church and church people, he put me into that box, and I no longer was the kind of friend that he wanted or the kind of friend that he thought, you know, I, I was trying to be, just a good friend. So, you know, the question is, how, how is it that church people can become so awkward? And I know I'm talking to us. But how, how, sometimes you, you've seen it. People can become awkward. Why? And I think what it is is that we know 
that Jesus told us to go into all the world and make disciples. We're familiar with that passage. I mean, every church talks about our mission is to go into the world and make disciples. But we're really uncomfortable with the way Jesus did that. So we do it our way. It's amazing to me that denominations will train their missionaries to go to other cultures. They will learn the culture the language, they will learn everything about it. They will be taught to build relationships in these other cultures so that they can share this message and hope of Jesus with those people. Yet those same churches that send those missionaries don't do the same thing in their own neighborhoods. We we don't get to know our culture. Instead, we reject our culture. We don't get to know our neighbors. We don't try to, to, you know, play nice with with the community. But that's what Jesus did. That was the example that he gives. He intentionally tried to get to know people. So instead, churches, church people, we often try to reach people, but we don't want to get to know them. And what happens is we look weird. What's funny is we don't look weird to us. I mean, the people who put those signs up, they really thought they were being noble or bold or what I don't know what. But to the outside community, which is us even, because we don't like that, we are like, that's weird. So many of us, the, many of the rest of us, like people in here, we feel like sometimes you have to constantly apologize for the behavior of what other people see on TV when Christians do stuff. But we're supposed to be more and more like Jesus. Because if, if that's what it means to, for his kingdom come, for his will to be done, If it means becoming more and more like Jesus, what does that look like? And that's what we're going to, when we go into the scriptures right now, that's where we're going to be. God, um, or John, the the very beginning of his gospel, he explains a big picture about Jesus. And I'm going to do some snapshots. And I I normally like to preach through one passage of scripture, but this series has made that hard because as we talk about the kingdom, we're looking at little pictures, little snapshots. And so I'm going to be looking at a couple more snapshots today. But the beginning of John, it says that God became flesh and dwelt among people. Now, in theological terms, we call this the incarnation. Jesus became incarnate. God became flesh. He is the God who became man. God pursued his creation, us, and chose to live right alongside, right in the midst of people. So basically, when I was a youth pastor, we used to say God with a bod (laughs) or God with skin on him. That was what Jesus was, God with skin. And in in Scripture, over and over, his people, the church, were called Jesus' body. So we, it, Jesus is God with skin on it. We are basically Jesus' skin. We are his tangible presence in the world. In the same way Jesus came to live with us, we are called to go and make disciples of all nations, to go into the world and live with others. See, some people, some pastors, we like to use big words, and so we'll say what we're supposed to do is live incarnationally, incarnational living. We're supposed to be Jesus in our neighborhoods and in our families and in our communities. I like the words, we're just supposed to be his hands and feet. It just makes more sense to me and I like it. But we are called as Jesus' body to be his hands and feet in in, in the world. Now, I know I've said that a million times since I've been here. It's one of my favorite statements because I constantly try it. Lord, help me learn what that means to be your hands and feet in the world. Now, So let me kind of flesh that out a little bit. Being Jesus' hands and feet is basically following two commands. Love God and love people, your neighbor, others. Love God, love people. That is what, when we do that, we are becoming more and more like Jesus because he spent his entire life showing us what does this look like to love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. When it comes to Jesus loving people, because we've talked about loving God, we talked about it last week, about how to know God and how important it is to know God. So as we look at this last part about loving people, loving your neighbor, when it comes to loving people, Jesus was given a title by the religious leaders. He was called a friend of sinners. Now they meant this, I'm sure, kind of as an insult. But I think Jesus liked this title. I really do. 
Look at a couple of the snapshots of how Jesus was a friend of sinners. And we're not going to look at a lot of them, but if you look at Matthew here, it says, a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So Jesus reached out his hand, touched the man, touched the leper, and said, I am willing. Be clean. Now, you've got to understand something. No Jew in this day, especially a rabbi, would ever touch a leper. In fact, the Old Testament law said it, it was, you weren't allowed to do that. It, if you touched a leper, you became unclean. But what's interesting is that instead of the leper's uncleanness being transferred to Jesus, when Jesus touched the man, his cleanness was transferred to Jesus. I mean, to Jesus, to the leper, sorry. So instead of the leper's uncleanness transferring, Jesus' cleanness transferred to the leper. That is amazing. And you wonder, I mean, really, how long had it been since that leper felt the warmth touch of a human being. I mean, how long? If, if his culture was not allowed to touch him, how long had it been since he felt the warmth of human touch? And there Jesus was, putting his hand on him and healing him. There's another picture. It says that a Roman officer came. A Roman officer came and pleaded with Jesus, Lord, my young servant lies in bed, paralyzed and in terrible pain. So Jesus said, I will come and heal him. I'll heal your servant. But the officer said, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are. My servant will be healed. All right? And then it continues. When Jesus heard this, he was blown away. He was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth. I haven't seen faith like this Roman (laughs) in all of Israel. Okay, so first of all, this is a Gentile. A Gentile. Back then, Jews, Gentiles, separate. They didn't have any, they did not like each other. They didn't want to be around each other. And Jesus, I mean, no Jew would ever go into a Gentile's house. That's worse than touching a leper. You did not go into a Gentile's house. But here Jesus is like, I'll go. You have a sick servant, I'll go. I'll go into his house. But this isn't just any Gentile. This is a Roman guard. Hello. I mean, the Romans, they were the oppressors of the Jewish people. This guard was one of those people who would crucify anybody who went against them. And Jesus is saying, I'll go to your house. The guy says, no, it's okay. I trust you. Say it. My servant will be healed. And Jesus is like, even compliments his faith. He can't even believe. You know, Jesus grew up in this Jewish world, and he says, I've never seen faith like this Roman centurion in all my life here in Israel. So not only did Jesus befriend those lepers, those people who were rejected, he also reached out to bullies? Who would have thought it? Who would have thought? But then, a third picture. He meets a guy named Matthew. Matthew is a tax collector. He's worse than the first two. Because you got lepers, they can't help it. They're just broken and messed up, but they can't help it. And then you have a Roman centurion, a bully. I mean, this guy, uh, he, can't, he didn't choose to be a Roman. He was born into that too. But he's still, I mean, this is the enemy. Then you have Matthew, a tax collector. He was a Jew who chose to be a traitor. He was a Jew who said, I'm going to take taxes from my people, except I'm going to extort them. I'm going to take more than I should. That's tax collectors were the most despised of people. And here you have Matthew, a tax collector. Jesus goes up to this guy. And by the way, I think this is fascinating, is that that Matthew, that traitor tax collector, is the guy who wrote this gospel. Um, You know, Jesus goes up to Matthew, says, follow me. He does. And then it says, immediately after that, Matthew recalls, while Jesus was having dinner at my house, (laughs) <laughs> many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. So Jesus goes to a tax collector's house. The tax collector's throwing this huge party because he is, you know, hosting the celebrated Jesus, the guy going around healing everybody, teaching everybody. So he's pretty excited, brings his friends. And when the Pharisees see this, they ask Jesus' disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors? I mean, like, really, again, the worst of the worst, and sinners. 
Why would he do that? They were dumbfounded because their whole life they'd been taught about separation. They were taught to stay away from bad people. They had learned to think of themselves as better than those other people. So why would Jesus, a rabbi, spend time with these, these, these sinners? But Jesus said, I, I didn't come for good people. I didn't come for the righteous. The healthy don't need a doctor. The sick, they're the ones who need me. The unrighteous, the sinners, those whose lives are broken, those whose lives are messed up, they need me. And so I ask you, Lakeside, who are the messed up people? All of us, including the Pharisees. They just didn't understand that. We're all messed up. And there's so many stories. There's a story of Jesus forgiving a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. Hello. There is a a story about um, Jesus staying with the dreaded Samaritans for two days, teaching them. The story of the woman at the well. When the whole community finds out that who Jesus is, what he said, he tells her, I am the Messiah. And the whole community comes out and they say, will you stay with us and teach us? And he does. He goes into the Samaritan city and he, he lives there for two days teaching them. Amazing. He offers forgiveness and dignity to prostitutes. I mean, this is, this is a picture of Jesus that I think these are Hallmark movies, man. We watch these things and we're like, that is such a good story. Did you know what was going to happen? Of course, every Hallmark story is the same. Couple or two people, they come together, they're friends, something happens that splits them up, but they come together at the end. And I am a sucker for every single one of those stories. My wife, you know, we've had, we've had Hallmark Channel on every day since Thanksgiving. And I mean, since Thanksgiving, since Halloween. And I'm like, you know, doing stuff around the house. And what's really crazy is I've seen this one three times. I don't know what it is. There, I know. It's like, we see this story with Jesus. You know how it's going to end because it's so good every time. And every time you see the story, it's so compelling because you go, I love this. I mean, the prostitute who has to do what she does to survive because she has no way to own land. She's not allowed to have a job. She doesn't have a husband or maybe she's a widow or she's never had a husband, there is only one way that she can survive, and it is to sell herself. And Jesus says, it doesn't have to be like this. I love you. I want to give you hope. I want to give you life. Follow me. And you're like, I love these stories. And that's the story, that's the story of Jesus. That's the story that our churches should show. He came for everybody. Jesus bridged the gap between God and people. And as his body, that's our job, to bridge the gap between God and people. So let's make this really relevant. Because see, in the Bible, over and over, words like this are used for us, his people. You are God's ambassadors. And what does an ambassador do? He goes to a different culture. And he, he becomes a part of that culture to bridge the gap between who he is an ambassador for and who he is an ambassador to. We are ambassadors, God's ambassadors. There's another passage that says, we are God's holy priests to unite God and people. And I I know I've said it like seven times since I've been here, I'm sorry, but I, I love the picture. A priest is somebody who stands between God and people and he holds the hand of people, he holds the hand of God and he brings them together. That's the role, that's the job of a priest. We are God's priests, to hold the hand of our community, our neighbors, our family, our friends, our co-workers. And we hold the hand of God and we say, in the most loving way possible, I want to bring you two together. We are priests. To do this, we must choose to love those who are rejected. We must be willing to sacrifice our reputation for other people. We must choose to get involved in people's lives. Because we are Jesus' hands and feet, and that's what he did. You know, students, it's looking around the lunchroom at school and seeing people who are sitting by themselves and either inviting them to your table or going to sit with them. Yeah, but what will everybody think of me? Exactly. Adult, it's, it's shoveling the driveway for somebody who's in need. You know, it's inviting a coworker to lunch. And if you don't mind, just a little sidebar. If you're married... Or if the person you're inviting to lunch is married, please, same gender. <laughs> guys, you don't need to be going, married guys don't need to be going to lunch with married women. 
And I, that's just a sidebar that really means a lot to me because we have seen so many problems that have happened because of that. So, but guys, inviting a guy to lunch, ladies inviting a, a lady to coffee, and that is a great way to get to know people. It's serving people. It's listening to their stories. Listening. That's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? I'm a pastor, man. We struggle. We like to talk, 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 and, you know, we just want to go. But listening to their stories and then maybe being vulnerable enough to share your story, not the picture you want them to see of you, (laughs) but the real story. Maybe getting to know them is is being vulnerable and not pretending that you have it all together because you don't. I asked you at the beginning and nobody raised their hand who had it all together. So I know you're broken and messed up just like me. And so maybe other people need to hear that. Wow, you don't act like you're perfect because everybody knows you're not perfect. But nobody's going to tell you if you're trying to make everybody think you're perfect. (laughs) So I mean, I think being Jesus' hands and feet, being like him is being a friend. I think that's why people, messed up people, were so drawn to Jesus. He was a friend. He made them feel valuable. He loved them. He didn't challenge them with their bad behavior unless they asked him. And when they asked him, he did. He told them, do this, do this, or do this. And you know what happened if they did that? Awesome. But what if they rejected Jesus' words? Did he stop loving them? No. It says that that rich young ruler came and said, uh, you know, what does it take to follow you? And Jesus said, give up, you know, the guy had a money issue. And he said, "Give, give up your money, give it all to the poor and follow me. And the guy left Because he didn't want to do that. And what does it say as he left? And Jesus loved him. He didn't reject him or rebel and say, fine, go your own way. He loved him. The Apostle Paul, he was trying to model Jesus to a group of Christians when he wrote these words. Another, you know, I have like a couple of favorite verses in the Bible. This is one of them. Paul says, we loved you, and it was the church at Thessalonica. We loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news. We didn't just preach to you and teach to you and help you build your church. No, no, no. We shared our own lives too. See, it's not about just accomplishing a bunch of things for God. No, no. Part of accomplishing anything for God is loving people. It's just being there. It's the relationship. And he says, we loved you so much that we didn't just share the good news. We shared our own lives too. Because that's what... Loving Jesus, that's what loving people is. Spending time with them and putting them first. It's not having an agenda to get something from them, but it's sharing life together. Real quick story. Um, Ray Lynn and I lived across the street from this guy, Brent. He, uh, he and I had this yard work relationship because you know on Saturdays we'd always be out in the yard working and we'd always strike up a conversation and Brent liked to talk. And I mean literally an hour would go by and we'd just be standing there you know, no more gas in the mower or anything, and just talking. And, um, you know, it was always small talk at first. He'd talk about the deer he shot. One time he put it in the garbage can like four days before. Oh, my gosh, don't even want to go there. And so for you deer hunters, please be nice. Okay, put it in a bag. Anyway, um, we talk about work. He loved talking about craft beer, a- any beer. And we, we'd talk about all the different ones. It was awesome. It was great. And at Christmas, Ray Lynn and I took him over a basket, a gift basket for him and his wife. And we stood there in the doorway and talked forever. A few months later, he calls me up and he asked me to come over. So I go inside. I'd never been in his house before. And we just talk. He and his wife were having problems and they were getting separated. And he didn't know what to do. As we talked, he started sharing some of his life story. He started asking me questions about God. And that night, our relationship changed because we really started sharing life together. It was like it was beyond small talk now. We, my daughters would have a birthday party when they were little kids. And we'd say, hey, you're welcome to come over. We're having some friends over. We would all, always just, you know, we brought them dinners and stuff like that. And there was a time we were out of town and he'd unexpectedly mow our lawn. We never asked or anything. And what's interesting is how much we talked about God and how I never brought God up. I was not the one. He always brought God up. And it was so normal because we were friends And we had just cared for him in a time that was really hard. I wouldn't give that relationship up for anybody. No, I'm not bragging because this one, he started the conversations. He's the one who walked into my yard while I was mowing. You know, I just was the recipient. And I was like, when he did that, I said, intentional. (laughs) Well, Lord, thanks for spurring him to come talk to me because I didn't think about it. You know, so I'm not bragging. I just know that, I know I've missed a lot of opportunities 
to be Jesus' hands and feet to people. But when it happens and you take advantage of it, oh my gosh, it's fun. What's really interesting to me that it's a lot easier being a friend and it's a lot more fun being a friend than trying to make a convert. Do you realize that nowhere in Scripture says go and make converts? It is not there. What does it say? Go and make disciples. What is a disciple? A disciple is a relationship. A convert, I don't know why, it just seems like a notch on the belt. But a disciple is a relationship. It's friendship. It's respect. It's love. A disciple is somebody who is growing in that relationship to become more and more like the one they are following. That's what a disciple is. Making disciples, I think, begins with being intentional about the things you already do. It's, you, you already live your lives. And so rather than going around with your little, you know, pamphlet, which I know nobody does that anymore, but when I was a kid, we were given stacks of pamphlets to hand out to people and, hey, get to know God, get to know God. And you know people got my pamphlet and were like, oh, thank you. I've been waiting for this pamphlet my whole life. No, instead, we'd, we'd hand them out at the lake, and as you're leaving, you're seeing 500 pamphlets laying around the lake. Yeah, that's what happened. So it's not, and I'm not saying that's terrible. If that's what God's called you to do, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be that guy. I'm just saying that be a friend is so much more fun. You know, it's like doing the stuff you're already doing. You already eat lunch. Invite somebody with you. You already watch the Packers and eat brats. Invite somebody over to do it with you. You go to church already. You're here. When was the last time you invited somebody? Maybe, maybe you like to fish, bike. Maybe you antique shop, which I have never figured out. But maybe you do. Maybe you like movies or you like to drink coffee. Go do these things with God and with others in mind. Go to the same restaurants. Ask for the one server that you really like or you're really connected with and just keep sitting in that person's section and tip them so well. And write a note on the receipt to say, thanks so much, you know, prayed for you today or Scott and Linda, when we were at a restaurant one time, they were like, talk to the server. Tell us, what, tell us what's going on in your life. We're about to pray. We'd like to pray for you. And she did. And I was like, what? I mean, it's like spending time getting to know people. Do the stuff you do. Just think about God while you do it. Think about how you can love people while you do it. It's amazing that when you start doing things that you love and you're doing them with other people, how much conversation just automatically gets started. It's amazing. Take your dog for a walk. Take your kids for a walk and change one thing. Say hi to people as you go by them. You will be shocked at how many times people stop you and talk for a half hour, 45. It's true. I mean, because people are like, wow, you expressed an interest. Be friendly. Don't be a jerk at work. Be a good boss. Ask questions. Ask about people's family and interests and then listen. And I would tell you, one other thing, you can join a fam- fantasy football league. I was once invited to a fantasy football league that nobody in, went to church. All right? It was a family member invited me. I went, the most fun I've ever had. They knew I was a pastor, but they didn't care. I was on their turf, and they were going to act the way they act. And um, I could share so many stories, but they would not be appropriate from, from here. So, but as the season started, the first game, one guy posted on the online forum when our teams played, and this is what he said. He said, Don, I'm gonna, it's going to hurt me to beat a man of the church like I'm going to, to beat on you in this season opener. It is fantasy football, and there is no room for niceness. So once again, sorry about the epic beatdown you're going to get. Yours truly, the soon-to-be league champ. Well, I took that. I was like, I am in the right place. I love this. So I responded exactly like I knew I should. I said, dude... I'm here to help your prayer life. I'm going to kick your butt so bad you end up lying in a fetal position, rocking back and forth saying, God, what happened? God, what happened? (laughs) He replied back to me like, LOL, funniest thing. I mean, and I was like, just that moment of being real and having fun with a guy, it was the best year of fantasy football ever. And the smack talk was, I mean, it was was just fun. It wasn't dirty. it It was just fun. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I think this is the last verse. The Apostle Paul said, I try to find common ground. I mean, fantasy football, who'd have thunk? Common ground with everybody, doing everything I can to save some. I want to be Jesus' hands and feet to everybody. I want to encourage you. You know, you have a pen in front of you. You have a connection card in your your thing, your bulletin. Write this verse down if you can. 1 Corinthians 9.22. This is one to memorize. This is one to have up here forever. 
because I think this is a key to the gospel. This is a key to being Jesus' hands and feet. It's, it's not running away being separate from the world like that means we can't know them. Being separate from the world means being separate from the system. The system of the world says if you buy stuff, you'll be happy. If you get a better job, you'll be happy. If you buy a new house, you'll be happy. If you just get the right girl or guy, you'll be happy. And we know that doesn't work. That's the system of the world. And Paul says be separate from that. But he doesn't say be separate from people. He says I try to find common ground with everybody so that I can be Jesus' hands and feet to them. So ask, ask yourself, how can you do this? How can I love people the way God has lavished his love on me? How can I be a friend of sinners so that they know I like them? Before, I'm, before I pray, uh, close in prayer, I, I want to uh, show you just a quick story. It's a quick video of, um, of a story I saw about this, this couple who moved into a neighborhood and had this picture of being Jesus' hands and feet. So it's like a minute and a half, so just... Take a look real quick. We wanted to be in a neighborhood where we could uh, be engaged with other people. So there was an apartment complex near this house that was a lot of people would look at and say, wow, that's scary. I don't know if I want to be in this neighborhood, uh, but it attracted us. One of the things we wanted to do was just have a, a cookout for our neighborhood. We just decided, you know, we wanted to do this, but we wanted to do it in our front yard, not our backyard. You know, a lot of times you say, oh, let's do that often you know, have a privacy area. Well, we wanted to be involved with our neighbors. We've had several since then. Uh, and it's really a lot of fun. It's just a great way to engage with them is over food. Bring them in for food and then you'll get conversation. So it was literally like the first week we moved in, I got a message on my phone and it said, you might not know me, but I'm your neighbor. You want to come to a barbecue at our place tonight? Yeah, and since then they've been helping all of our neighbors, all of their neighbors. We've seen them bring us meals, They've do had so much for dinner. Yeah, do so much for this street and this neighborhood. Through relationships with people, you can trust each other. You can depend on each other. I think that um, being involved in people's lives can be very messy. And it's really a lot easier to just drop something off, drop the blanket off, put some money in an envelope and send it off. That's really the easy thing. And I feel like giving of our time is really, um, is a good thing. And it just, it can be difficult, but I think that's what we are called to. Um, we just want to be involved with them. We want to love them. It feels like they're our family. Um, when one of the guys invited me over to his house because he wanted me to meet uh, this new girl in his life, uh, and it just felt like I had, a, I had a place in his family too. Wherever we are, we want to do whatever we can to fulfill the Great Commission. While we're here, we want to be engaged with our neighbors. Isn't that great? I love that picture. I love that his neighbor, he was so involved in this younger guy's life that when he, he finally met a girl that he really liked, he was like, I want you to come meet her. I mean, it was almost like you could tell like a little bit of a dad thing there going because who knows? I love these pictures. This is what it's involved. This is what it means to be involved in people's lives being Jesus' hands and feet. If you are not a follower of Jesus, this might be a very different picture of Christianity than you've seen. But I want to assure you, this is the one that Jesus meant for it to look like. He meant for this picture of serving and loving. That's what it's, that's what it's supposed to be like. If that's not what you've seen, if you've been hurt, again, I'm sorry. I, but I want you to know, it's not supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be this way. God desires for you to find life and hope in him. He desires for you to feel loved. If you are a follower of Jesus, it is the same. It is not about oppression and guilt. It is about freedom and life. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Your sins are, are forgiven. I, some of you still you struggle with addictions or you struggle with anger, or things that you just feel like you can't control and you like always feel beat down. It's forgiven. God wants to offer you life. Take steps forward. Stop worrying about penance, trying to make it, you know, trying to fix it before you can move on. You can't fix it. You're broken. I'm broken. Move on. Walk in Jesus. Allow him to do, you're going to mess up. Is that okay? Of course not. I want you to get better. But walk forward in Jesus with confidence that he wants to do something in you and do something through you. You don't have to be fixed before God uses you. 
because you're not going to be fixed until the end. That's the invitation today. If you, I want to encourage you. I want, I want to challenge you. Find relationships in your life that you already have and start thinking intentionally, God, how can you use me? And if you are not a follower of Jesus, I, I, want, I want to challenge you to open your heart up to something that maybe you haven't experienced, a God who has been pursuing you your whole life, who loves you and wants to offer you life. Let's pray together, and then we'll, we'll continue worshiping. Lord, I want to thank you. You have given us an amazing picture of what it looks like to love God and love neighbors. And so many of us, we just don't do that very well because it's hard and it's selfless. And so I pray for our church that you help us to be selfless. I pray that you give us the, a passion for our neighbors that we are willing to look around and, and, and see people around us that we can love and, and just be a friend with. Help us not to be so self-centered that it's just us and our, our little family, but that we see ourselves as ambassadors of Jesus and, and as priests of God. Father, there are people in here in a crowd this size, of course there are, that they haven't crossed that line. Or maybe they, they followed Jesus when they were young, but it's been so long. God, I pray that they will turn to you and, and recognize this beautiful picture of restoration and love and being pursued. And they will choose to follow you today. They will choose to give their life over to, to the one who gives life. We love you, Jesus. I pray that our church become the kind of place where your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In your name we pray, amen.